Brain injury is invisible, and on the outside, you can't see how lost a survivor can truly feel sometimes. Today's episode is a story of going from feeling lost to being found and finding hope and support through brain injury. There is always hope, and you are not alone. Hi, I'm Christabel Braden, and this is my brain injury podcast, Hope Survives. Here, we share information, education, and support for the brain injury community. This is an uplifting podcast to bring hope to your darkest days. As a survivor of traumatic brain injury and multiple concussions, I know what it's like to struggle to find hope. I don't want anyone to feel as alone as I did, and that's why I started my online community called Hope After Head Injury. This podcast is an extension of that, and I'd love to invite you to join along as we explore the realities of life with brain injury with messages of encouragement, interviews with doctors and professionals, and survivor stories. No matter where you're at on your journey, there is always hope. With a little hope, you can make it through today. With a little faith, someday you'll get through the pain. Just a little love is enough to light the way through your darkest night. Hope survives. Hope survives. Hey everyone, welcome back to Hope Survives Podcast. Today we have a very special episode as we are interviewing my friend and fellow brain injury survivor, Amanda Alamang. She is going to share her journey through brain injury, which has been for about 15 years, and what it has been like to start off with her TBI, not really have a lot of resources or symptoms. She's going to share about her, her journey, her struggle, her treatments, and then moving into finding support and how much that changed her life. It's really encouraging and a lot of the anecdotes and symptoms and things that she shares are super relatable and I hope that they bring encouragement to all of you. So Amanda actually went on to start her own brain injury support group, which she calls Lost and Found, which is kind of the inspiration of the title for this episode. Um, I think that as brain injury survivors, we often do feel very lost and it's really hard to cope and it's really hard to explain when we're kind of in the middle of it, because when you're feeling lost, you don't have the answers and you don't know how to express or how to share what you're going through. You don't even know how to explain your own symptoms because you can't even really process it very well. And so that feeling of being lost in brain injury, it's kind of like you sink into um, just the struggles. And if you can relate to this, you're not alone. The brain injury can feel like it takes over your whole identity. Um, and if you felt that way, I just want to give you a big hug <laughs> as much as I can through a podcast, a big virtual hug, I guess. Um, but I just want you to know that you really are not alone. And Amanda shares that she found a lot of hope and resources through the Brain Injury Association of Pennsylvania. And I'm just thrilled uh, to have, that's how I actually met her. I met her through the BIAPA and I've been volunteering with them for a while. And recently I was asked to join the board of directors. So I've been on the board of directors for the last, I want to say almost two years. Um, and it's been such an honor and a joy to get to serve what they're doing for the brain injured community brain injured community here in Pennsylvania. Now, you might notice if you are a uh, current listener to the podcast, I know some people listen later. So of course, you can listen to this, these episodes at any time at your own pace, whatever works for you. But I know we do have some people that listen each week when the episodes come out brand new. You might notice this is a couple of days late. And that's because <laughs> I got too overwhelmed. I tried to do too many things at once. Um, I posted this on our Instagram, Hope After Hendry page, but I wanted to also share it here. So the last two weeks I have been traveling. Two weeks ago, I was up in the Poconos leading worship 
at a retreat and it was such a beautiful experience. The speaker was talking all about suffering <laughs> and how do we suffer well and how do we look to the Lord through our suffering and have hope. Um, and it was just an incredible week. And then I was home very briefly over the weekend before heading back out. Um, this time flew down to Atlanta, Georgia for a retreat with an organization called Worship Circle, which I'm a part of. It is a worship leader mentorship program, and I am one of their volunteer small group leaders. <laughs> I don't talk a lot about, about it online or through this podcast, but um, that ministry has really poured a lot into my heart and given me a lot of life. So it was, it was really good. This is our once a year thing, and those things just happen to be back to back, right? Normally, I would never schedule that, but um, it's just how it happened to fall. And I knew that I would have to factor in recovery time and um, I planned ahead for it. So anyway, I have had these podcasts ready to go. And last weekend when I was home, I thought, you know what? I'm going to record the intro for this episode with Amanda and I will have it ready. And then on Friday, I can put it out, even though I'm still going to be kind of like traveling and stuff. Um, and I went to finally edit the episode this past weekend and I had forgotten to turn my mic on. <laughs> So I recorded it, but it wasn't picked up by my microphone and I'm looking at it and I'm like, on the one hand, I was really proud of myself for thinking ahead and actually recording it on time. But on the other hand, <laughs> I messed up by not turning on the mic. And my first reaction was to be hard on myself. My first brain reaction was to go, wow, Chris well and my negative self-talk in my brain was to be like you're so dumb how could you have done this you've done how many dozens and dozens of podcasts how in the world could you have not checked it why didn't you double check it that day like I just went almost to spiral on this train of negative self-talk and then I took a deep breath and I realized you know what I can still be proud of myself for thinking ahead to even record it. <laughs> I am proud of myself for that because if you've been listening to the podcast, you know I've had a hard time staying consistent and I've been so proud of myself for staying consistent this fall. And you know what? Even though I best laid plans didn't work out, I'm proud of myself for even trying. And so I hope to encourage you that even if the results aren't what you imagined or it doesn't fully pan out, Sometimes the act of trying and just the act of thinking ahead. And I never did that before with my TBI. And so to be able to have said, you know what? I thought ahead and I planned ahead and I did this. And that like takes a lot of cognitive things to like think steps ahead. And so I can still be proud of myself for that, even though the results didn't, didn't show for it. <laughs> So anyway, um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm still tired um, from traveling. I'm still kind of like resting, um, but I'm trying to ha work my days in a way. I'm sorry, my words are my words are slurring a little bit, um, but I'm trying to hold my days in a different way. I'm not trying to push myself to go from one thing to the next to the next. I've been learning to give myself more margin. And I also said to myself today, if I don't get to recording this intro today, it's fine. It's okay if I don't record it today. I can always do it later. I don't have to push myself, but I did get to recording it. Yay. So I'm hope hopeful to get the episode out um, actually today after I'm done with this. But anyway, thank you so much for listening and for being here. And I hope to encourage you to give yourself grace. Do not be hard on yourself. Man, brain injury is a journey and it's hard. And there's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of moving parts, and a lot of things that we don't even fully understand. You're asking your brain and body to do a lot every day and give yourself grace and be kind to yourself for just the efforts of trying. So as always, I want to invite you to join our online support groups. We've got Zoom support groups. We've got Brain Injury Bible Study on Zoom. And you can sign up for all those, I hope, after Hendry.com. So thank you so much for being here. And let's go ahead into today's interview with Amanda. I can't wait for you to meet her.
She's awesome. All right, let's do this. Today, we have a very special guest, my dear friend, Amanda. Thank you so much for being willing to come on the podcast. So I know Amanda through the Brain Injury Association of Pennsylvania. For many years, we've met through um, BIAPA events at the conference, and um, I'm just so excited. She started her own support group. She is a volunteer with the Brain Injury Resource Line. She does so much for the brain injury community and I'm so glad to have you here today. Thank you, yeah, I'm so excited to just finally get down, to sit down and chat with you. You know, like we're always just like, hey, how's it going, good, how are you? We never get a chance to like sit down and hang out and we live so far away, so this is so fun that we finally get to do this. I know, I'm excited. Um, yeah, I always, you know, like Christabel said, I always see her at conference and go to coffee house and stuff, but conference is so jam packed. And when you aren't downstairs, you're upstairs sleeping in your room. I don't <laughs> care what anybody says. <laughs> That's how it always goes at conference. You're always resting in between because you have to rest when you have a brain injury. You know, you have to allow yourself grace and listen to your body because you can't push yourself like you used to. Mm. You know, I myself am a survivor. Um, I am Oh gosh, I just turned 37. I feel like I'm so old. You're not old. So I just turned I just turned 37 in July. I sustained my brain injury when I was 18. So I have walked this path for quite a while now. And to some, it may seem that I have it figured out and I have it perfected, but every day is definitely a challenge. I was struck by a vehicle when I was crossing the street and sustained a frontal lobe, left frontal lobe injury. So a lot of my cognitive and like filter and stuff were just out the door, which is pretty common for people that have brain injury. But I never even knew what a traumatic brain injury was until I sustained one. And learning here in Pittsburgh, where I live, there's not really a whole lot of resources, at least there wasn't at, a, at the time whenever I sustained my injury. So I was sent home from the hospital after two weeks. I still was not able to walk. I was in a wheelchair. I struggled with speech and like any just cognitive thing that you always take for granted, like reading, writing, talking, walking, like all of the things that people around me were doing. And I knew I knew how to do it, but my brain was not allowing my body to execute those things like it once did, which was super frustrating. And I didn't know where to start. So when I was sent home after a two week hospital stay, I was still in a wheelchair and we lived on the second floor of an apartment. So it was very challenging. It was just my mom and I, my dad had passed away six months before my car accident. So we were still trying to figure out that new routine of life without dad. We had moved into a new apartment. So a lot of things were just new to us. And then we have this diagnosis that lands in our lap. And I was working full time at the time of my accident in a doctor's office. And I was also cutting hair on the side. So I had two jobs to help my mom suppl supplement her income. And I couldn't work. I could barely stay awake for longer than 30 minutes at a time. Um, back then, not like it was that long ago, but we didn't really have cell phones. So social media and stuff wasn't huge. So I didn't have to worry about having that to deal with. But even just like the sound of a fan in the room was piercing. It was awful. It was my head hurt all the time. My whole entire body hurt because of all the injuries that I had sustained. I had my head injury. I fractured my skull. I had an injury to my heart. I tore my ACL and then I was just covered in, you know, superficial bruises and cuts and bumps. And it was a long recovery. It was eight months that I was off work. I wasn't able to go back to work. And when I did go back to work, I still had to take breaks from the computer, worked at the front desk of a doctor's office. So, you know, blue lights weren't a thing or the blue light glasses weren't a thing yet under those horrible fluorescent lights in front of a computer screen. Even eight months after a traumatic brain injury is not, not the best thing for somebody who's in recovery. And we had no idea, you know, where to go, what road to take. I had no idea about the Brain Injury Association at the time. 
I was going through like concussion protocol, which is a great program, but it does not align with people that are living with a traumatic brain injury at all. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's where you slip through the cracks and a lot of your symptoms get overlooked. Yeah. And, you don't get and especially care. back when you had your, what year was your brain injury? Yeah. 2007. Okay. That was the same year as mine. 2007. Yeah. Mine was in December. Um, okay. So mine was in September. Yeah. And so just a couple months, I don't think I knew that, that they were that close yeah. to each other. <laughs> um, yeah. And I remember like 2008 was like the year I did most of my rehab and there really wasn't a lot of awareness about brain injury and right. there wasn't, the protocols were different then too than they are now because the research has they furthered were. so much further. And back then they were like, rest, do nothing, yeah. don't look at screens. And now we know you should do some sort of symptom limited activity. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it, it's hard. Uh, it's hard in those first, like what, what were your, emo what was your emotional state in that like beginning recovery period when you were just Super. first couple years, let's say. Yeah, the first couple of years, I was very frustrated. And now looking back, I realized that it was like the anxiety and the depression and all of those things like starting to creep up because I had no answers. And it was just my mom and I. So I was 18 at the time. Anything my mom said, you know, in my mind, she was never my age before. So she did not have the right answers. <laughs> so it caused a lot of like. I thought you were going the opposite direction. <laughs> No, no. I thought you were going like, to be no, like, no, yeah, no. like I was a teenager. Like, <laughs> no, no, That's it funny. ended up like causing a ton of like chaos and calamity between her and I because I had a brain injury and that brings out anger in people. And we didn't know that. So we had already had like a rocky relationship before then. My mom had struggled with substance abuse almost my entire life. So we didn't really have that type of friendship. So anything that she said, I fought against it. And looking back, like she was a great resource for me. She was a server. So she could talk to a rock and find out anything that she needed to know. So she had at the time ended up um, running into a gentleman named, I think his name was Tom Burns or Tim Burns. He actually just called me last night, which is like, Side story, I found his card in my mom's stuff when I was packing up her apartment. And I remember her handing me his card because he had facilitated a support group. And I was like, I don't need that. There's nothing wrong with me. What are you talking about? Not realizing that the behaviors and the things that I was doing was not normal. You know, I would forget to unplug my straightener. I would leave food in the oven and fall asleep. I would leave my car running and just get out and leave the door open and go into places and either come back out and find it like that. Or people that were with me would be like, listen, dude, like you left your car running on the hillside. You've got to be careful with that. And none of us knew, none of us knew that that was a normal symptom side effect of having a traumatic brain injury because your mind is basically mush. So to answer your question, a lot of frustration, a lot of depression, a lot of anger, and just feeling super isolated and not understanding why all of these people that were once a huge part of my life wanted nothing to do with me. Yeah. The night of my car accident, there was, I want to say like 25 plus people with me. We had taken a bus to a concert so we didn't have to drive. And all of the people were with me on the bus. Like when I got off the bus is how I got hit. I went to cross the street and the drunk driver was speeding down the street and hit me. So all of these people were there the night of my accident. All of these people see my accident. And yet now none of those people are a part of my life. And that's really heartbreaking. And I think for people who are new to the brain injury world and new to recovery back then, like I didn't realize that these people were slowly starting to fade away. And now, you know, fast forward this many years and there's nobody in my life. I don't have the same friends that I had. And yes, you know, we grow up and we evolve and we change as people. But a lot of it, I'm going to say, is probably due to my brain injury. Like we're tough people to be around, you know, cancel last minute plans. We yell at you for no reason because we're frustrated and we don't understand, which now I understand is I'm tired. I'm overstimulated. I ate the wrong thing. I didn't get enough sleep. You know, just pushing it exacerbates those symptoms. So being able to have my mom as my support system 
not accepting it at the time, but truly having her do the research and try to find out like all of these people by the grace of God have had essentially like landed in our life and were placed there to help me. And I wasn't willing to accept the help at the time. So this gentleman had a support group. I was like, I'm not doing that. Like support groups is for alcoholics and drug addicts. Like, no, not happening. And then maybe a year or two after that, my mom had met BJ Rayberg at a bus stop, who is a part of OVR, the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, which is they offer tons of different things for people with brain injury to disability to getting back into the workforce. Like they're a great resource. And she had given me his card. At the time, I wanted to go, <clears throat> excuse me, back to school to become a nurse. And somehow she had gotten on the subject with him and he had said that there were different ways to help me get into school um, to help with like assistive technologies and extended test taking and things like that. So again, I pushed it to the side because there was nothing wrong with me and this was normal and the way I was acting was totally okay. And my accident was in 2007. So then probably like late, late 2010, early 2011, I almost burnt our apartment down because I left dino nuggets in the oven almost overnight. Like I had fallen asleep and my mom woke up and she was like, what is going on? And we had like a a family meeting she was like you have to find help like this isn't okay you're gonna hurt somebody you're gonna hurt us we need to figure out what's going on so I bit the bullet and I reached out to BJ who ended up connecting me to BIAPA to the brain injury resource line which is where I met Joel Um, Joel is someone who's been on the resource line probably as long as you and I have been alive and if he watches this he's probably gonna kill me for that but Joel is he truly saved me the first night that I spoke to him on the phone. And if anybody knows Joel, you know, he too can talk to a rock and, you know, hang out with it and have a great time. He's a good talker. We spent three and a half hours on the phone the first night. And I finally felt like I was normal. I finally felt like there was somebody in this world that understood what I was going through and didn't want to push me away Mm -hmm. and didn't make me feel like a burden. So Joel had hooked me up with a ton of resources in my area that I didn't even know existed, including some more support groups. And I was like, I'm not going the support group route. Like it's never going to happen in the early days. Like, you know, you spend so much time in the hospital and at doctor's appointments and just talking about your injury that you just don't want to. You're finding a way to feel normal in a world that isn't normal anymore trying to figure out a way to go back to the person you were the day before your injury and you can't. So I started working with Joel. I was able to get funding from the head injury program, which is resource funding in Pennsylvania that's offered to Pennsylvania residents who have sustained their injury and need help with any sort of funding. And someone comes out and evaluates you and they figure out like what is best for you. Like for me, I had to do, they had advised, um, speech, physical therapy, occupational, and cognitive therapy. So the funding that I received from the head injury program helped cover all of that because the person who hit me didn't have insurance. So a lot of my like early treatment was cut short because we didn't have the money for it. And the statute of limitations in Pennsylvania with your health insurance is you have to wait 10 years before you receive any sort of care for an injury related to an accident, specifically an auto accident. So um, the head injury program really helped me get the care that I needed and have a neuropsych evaluation, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, vestibular therapy, all of the things that people typically go home with a list of prescription testing that needs to be done. I didn't have that because of the time of my accident. You know, back then that wasn't really prevalent. And we didn't have the funding for it. So the doctors were not going to waste their time sending me somewhere that I wasn't going to be able to afford anyways. So once I got all of that lined up and I started treatment, I really started to realize how severe my injury was and how great my deficits were from this diagnosis, which started to shed light on me just being a new normal, me just having you know, a new way of life that I needed to figure out almost like, you know, 
for a lot of people, I think maybe at one point you and I even talked about this, when the coronavirus hit, society hated being isolated. They hated not being able to leave their house. They hated that they couldn't talk to anybody. They couldn't go out and hang out with people, which we as survivors, like that was our life. People didn't want to be around us. We're difficult people to be around. We're hard people to hold friendships with. So being able to be reassured that there was a whole nother community out there for me was so helpful. And especially going back to work and trying to figure out a job that I was so good at and so fluent in, not even being able to figure out what was left from right at yeah. the time. I love, and, I, can can I just ask you real quick? Yeah. Um, I love how you were talking about just trying to find your place in this mm-hmm. new normal. Yeah. And I'd love to talk a little bit more about that because I think that a lot of people who have brain injuries, they feel lost in the mix. Mm-hmm. It's like the world keeps spinning and you're just stuck. Um, yeah. yeah, that's very accurate. Can you, relate, can you relate to that feeling? And what encouragement yeah. would you have for people who are struggling with this, like, my life and this world is not the way it was. And I like, there's a grief and you were just talking about the isolation, but there's also a grief with that. Can we talk a little bit more about that while we're here? Yeah, for sure. So that's a really good, really good. What is it? An analogy? You know, you're here and the world is just spinning around you a lot. Like they show in movies, like you truly just feel like you can't catch a break and everything around you even your home, which once was your sanctuary, is like chaos to you because you just can't figure it out. So I found a lot of help within the Brain Injury Association and in that community. I'm a huge advocate for conference. I think conference, I went for the first time in 2011. That was truly the very first time since my accident that I actually felt like people Mm -hmm. understood me. And and let me just clarify, people that are listening that might not know what you're talking about. So it's a brain injury conference here in in our state in Pennsylvania. However, um, what she's talking about can relate to any sort of like, if you can get to any sort of support group or conference, something where you can connect with other people that know about brain injury. That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, Yeah, for sure. And your state, most states you can find have like a subsidiary on the Brain Injury Association of America website. So you can probably find a lot of support groups and a lot of links on BIAA.org to find what's in your area. If there is a conference or support group or any sort of community activities where you can just go and not have to like explain yourself, not have to introduce yourself and start off and say, I need you to say that again. I have a brain injury. I don't understand. Or... I'm sorry, I'm really tired. I have a brain injury. I can't pay attention to you, which is hard to own in the beginning because you're saying there's something wrong with me. I'm not, and I absolutely hate this word. I'm not neurotypical anymore. And being able to be in a community or even just for a couple hours, be in a space with people that get it that don't make you feel pressured when you're struggling with the aphasia and the word loss because your brain is just jumbled just to be you like you were before your injury. You know, we all lived what we thought were normal lives before we got hurt. And then we received this diagnosis. However it is that you received it. Now you don't have anybody. So being able to have people in your corner for a few hours a month or once a year you end up finding connections that may not be next door to you. Like Christabel and I live, I think it's about four hours away from each other. But at any given point, like we could reach out to one another and say, I really am not having a good day. Like lift me up, talk to me, give me some words of advice. Because as we learned today, our, our accident, our injuries were both so close together. So we're kind of in similar timelines of our recoveries. But my recovery doesn't look anything like your recovery. Your diagnosis doesn't look anything like my diagnosis. So it's nice to be able to find other people out there that are living with it, which also helps if you have a support system, a mom, dad, brother, sister, spouse, who's also living as a survivor or a spouse of a survivor or sibling of a survivor, 
they too can find people within the community to help them. Mm -hmm. And is that why you started your own support group? Yeah. So good, great question. Thanks. So I, it took me a long time, you know, to start a support group and I didn't want to have it in a hospital and we have tons of places around the city that we could use, you know, coffee shops and restaurants and stuff. And there is a support group that meets in Philadelphia that meets in a subway restaurant, which I always thought was really cool because it's casual. People can eat. It's somewhat quiet. And I liked that idea. So I started to talk to Monica Vaccaro, who's also part of the Brain Injury Association, about starting my own support group and how do I do it. And I started to research some places, started to visit some different places. And if you don't have a brain injury, a coffee shop, Panera, Subway, things like that aren't really that overstimulating for you. But for us, it's awful (laughs) to go into a coffee shop, to go into a Subway. It's loud. It's distracting. It's not enjoyable. So I had realized that I was going to need to bite the bullet and host my support group at a hospital. So I had worked within the health system, our local health system. So I had reached out to somebody that runs like the room rentals at the hospital. And I was able to get a small room to start my support group. And as I said earlier, I love the idea of the support group at the subway. And then another fellow survivor, Kevin McDonald hosts a survivor's night out in the Westchester area. So another opportunity for you to be in the community with other survivors in a less structured environment. So I kind of took those two ideas and that's what I modeled my support group after was a survivor's night out of just being able to go and be yourself. So I have speakers that come. I give them about 45 minutes to talk to us and then the rest of the time is just for us to just hang out and feel normal and be able to discuss your injury and your symptoms if you want, or just hang out without having to give a reason for how you are the way you are. Mm -hmm. And you call it lost and found. And I love that title. Why did you pick that title? uh, So there was a, Alyssa Dowds used to be a part of the Brain Injury Association of Pennsylvania. She's moved to Texas, but her and I started to collaborate with this support group. And we were at, um, I think it was like a pizza shop or something. And we're like, what are we going to call this group? Like, we, it needs to be something easy and catchy. And she was like, what about something like, I don't know, like lost and found. And I was like, that's so good. Like, that's the best one yet. And it just stuck. And it's truly like you lost yourselves and now you found us and we're all in this together. Mm. So it's um, it's definitely stuck. And we've been together for five or six years Mm -hmm. now, you know, COVID kind of with like a lot of the support groups kind of pushed us apart. We went virtual for a while and then we started to meet at a local park um, that was outside. And now we've moved back to the hospital and we're much smaller than we were. Um, At one point we had like 40 members. That's amazing. Which is amazing that we had the opportunity to spend the time Mm -hmm. with so many people. And you just took the initiative to start it. And I love that because so many of our listeners feel isolated and alone. And if you, if you're listening to this, maybe you're feeling like, Oh, maybe this is something I could do. Like I could start a support group. Um, and I'm sure Amanda would be willing to chat with you about how she did it. Um, but you know, finding support. So we were talking about the new normal. I'd love to switch gears here because we've talked a lot about, community and support. Um, and so I'd love to switch gears a little bit and talk about your symptoms and like coping strategies and how do you just live on a day by day basis in the new normal? Yeah, good question. So before I was in my accident, I never even had so much of a headache. Like I didn't even understand when people would say, Oh, my head hurts so bad. I've never had to deal with that. I was so young when I sustained my injury, I was only 18. So I didn't know what anxiety, depression, and anger and things like that were. So early days, I struggled with just constant pain all over my body related to all of the injuries I had with my brain injury and trying to figure out a good cocktail that worked to help control all of those symptoms. 
and dealt with a lot of like visual issues and inner ear issues and balance and things like that that I never had before. And not knowing what a brain injury was, it was very difficult to be able to explain that to anybody because I didn't know what I was dealing with. You didn't have the language to say my vestibular system is off or whatever. You you were just like, I feel like I'm probably on a boat. Like that's how I always felt. You just kind of feel unsteady all the time. Yeah. Just, I always felt like the way I would explain it to my mom and I always, for some reason would recognize it when I was either laying down or when I was in the shower, because we had white walls and a white curtain. And like, I just felt like I couldn't catch a point to just stop. Like it always felt like the world was spinning. Not for me, it wasn't even like the same type of dizziness when you're on a spinning ride. It was more like it almost felt like my ears were spinning around my head Mm -hmm. was the way I would explain it. Like there was super loud noises in my ears, which was ringing in my ears. I couldn't explain that. And I just couldn't get my footing. Like I just couldn't figure out how to stop. Nothing helped it. So I dealt with the pain all over my body and then horrific migraines. Like I had mentioned earlier, the sound of a ceiling fan was probably like a rock concert to some people to me. And I couldn't get it to stop. Even when I plugged my ears, when I plugged my ears, the ringing would get louder, the dizziness would get worse. So I couldn't find any relief. And I didn't want to be on like narcotics or opioids my whole life. So I tried to muscle through it the best that I could. And living with constant pain can bring out the worst in people. And having like I struggled with a lot of numbness, like in my hands and in my feet from my injury. And I had like, not a spinal cord injury, but I had an injury like to my spinal cord. So that's what was causing the numbness and like the tingling and things in my extremities. So having to go through like all of the early nerve testing, vestibular testing, um, concussion protocol and things like that it brings out the worst in you because you're going to these places. You're not getting any answers because in 2007, most of the concussion protocol is what TBI people fell under. And I was so much more than that. So I kept getting told like, well, we don't know, you know, you hit your head pretty hard, try this medicine and that wouldn't work or try this medicine that wouldn't work. So Anything and everything that could be prescribed for a brain injury, I've tried it and have had whatever, you know, the 9,000th side effect is, I had it. (laughs) Like, so much worse than ever possible. So to be able to find a medication that worked for me with a care team that I trusted was also extremely difficult. You know, it took my neurologist that I see now, who is a neurophysiatrist, I waited over a year to see him on a wait list. And my first appointment was like two to three hours long. And I was finally at a point of a list of prescriptions that he narrowed it down to two. One of them was a daily medication. The other one was a triptan to take like whenever you have an onset. I hadn't felt that good since my accident. I hadn't had such relief since my accident because I was taking so many different medications that you have the side effects from the medications and the symptoms from the accident, from the injury. So being able to have a provider that you and a care team that you truly trust in is another huge aspect to a successful Mm -hmm. recovery. And I I don't want to gloss over it. How long did you wait to see this doctor? A year. year. So So many people will find my podcast like when they first get injured or maybe in the first, you know, beginning stages. And if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, my gosh, like I don't have the right care or whatever, like sometimes it does take time to find the right treatment. Like you didn't find the right treatment or the right doctors or the right medications right away. Like it took years. And I know that's a little discouraging. (laughs) to hear and I don't want to discourage you but remember Amanda and I both had our injuries in 2007 so those of you seeking care now are hopefully landing at the right doctors sooner Um, and if you're listening to this podcast hopefully the resources and other episodes have helped you to find the right doctors sooner but it does take time and as like the theme of your overall 
story and kind of the theme that you've been sharing is like finding this place, your place in this new normal, in this new world, mm -hmm. in this new um, life that you never asked for, that you didn't want. And so right. finding the right care, um, can you share a little bit, like you already shared, you lost a lot of friends and mm -hmm. again, I'm so sorry for your loss with your father and everything. Um, I can't imagine going through grief and the brain injury at the same time. Um, yeah, it was definitely an odd period because I didn't have any memory of losing him. <sighs> So when I came home to the apartment that my mom and I had moved into, I didn't remember moving out of the house that I grew up in. So I landed on the porch of this apartment and I was like, where am I? Where's my dad? Oh. What is going on? Because I had zero memory. Like I have some, even to date, like some spotty memories of the night of the accident, but nothing huge. And of my dad, like, I can look at pictures and stuff and it takes me back there, but it's hard to remember like him as a person mm -hmm. in my childhood and having pictures and being able to go back and look at that is truly what helped me remember my childhood. But even now, like a lot of it, I don't remember. Yeah. And I just lost my mom in May. So, so I now don't have my yeah. memory box of my life. So it's, almost like reliving my accident again and memory for a lot of people who have sustained injury is one of the main things that they struggle with short-term memory, long-term memory. And that in itself is enough to send somebody mad on top of pain and symptoms that you can't control. So while yes, it did take me a year to find a care team that fit me, um, I live in an area that we have two major health systems and you have to have the right insurance to see a doctor. So there was a lot of other things that played into me having to wait a year. So that's not always the case for survivors. So I don't want people to think like, I'm just not even going to try to get care because it's not going to work out. Like there were a lot of different mm -hmm. aspects that played into me having to wait a year yeah. to see him, my health insurance, his wait list, my work schedule, and it's not always like yeah. that. So I don't want people, like you said, I don't want people to be discouraged. <laughs> but also think, like, they're be encouraged to... that, you know, I want to, I want to kind of fast forward because we are coming towards the end of our time. So I want to talk a little bit about where you're at now. And, um, so you're married and you have a yes. daughter. Um, yes. and so a lot of people with TBI, you know, have stories similar to yours and they feel like they, you know, are never going to find someone to date that will understand or accept their brain injury or they're worried about can they ever be a mother or, or a father or a parent. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of where you're at now, how your TBI kind of shaped that journey? I know it's a lot to talk about in a short period of time, but yeah. um, I'd love to hear a little bit about like, you know, your dating process into getting married, finding someone with with you having a brain injury. And then I'd love for you to talk about the process of, of becoming a mother. Yeah, for sure. So I met um, my husband after my accident. So he, which was quite helpful because I didn't have to like explain to him what had happened to me. So I met him after my accident. Um, this Friday, we'll actually be celebrating 10 years married. Congratulations. So it's a huge milestone. And when I had, I met him in 2011 when I had started like my care with OVR and the head injury program and stuff. So like he really had baptism by fire and was like thrown into the brain injury world without even knowing what it was. So he has been extremely supportive and understanding and has really taken the time to get to learn about brain injury and learn about the community and does sometimes come to our conference and different events within our community with me. And it's difficult because when you live with something that somebody never knew about and you have to try to explain it, it can be frustrating and hard. But if you find somebody who is supportive and who wants to learn, it makes it so much better to have that support system to be with you. And we 
had a daughter. She's going to be two. I can't even believe it on Saturday. So that was another thing that I struggled with. Trusting my body and trusting my instincts as a woman to become a mom. And it was a hard road for us to become parents. Um, we did struggle with infertility. We did have a loss and that's separate from my injury. It was not something that was caused by my injury, but when we finally became parents, I struggled so much with like, how am I going to keep this tiny human alive? It's taken me this many years to manage my symptoms, to figure out a routine that works for me. How do I need to, how am I going to keep somebody else alive? And I was scared with the medications that I was on. They obviously were not safe for pregnancy. So being off of all of these medications that have finally helped me, what is my life going to look like? And people look at me like I'm crazy, but when I was pregnant, it was the best I have ever felt mentally and physically in my entire life. And I had come off all of my medications by the time I was about 16 weeks pregnant. And I had my last headache migraine when I was about 16 weeks pregnant and she's going to be two on Saturday. And I've been mostly symptom free since then. So women's bodies are amazing. Um, what God has built us to do is incredible. What God has designed our bodies to do is incredible. And it's definitely, you know, she's definitely healed me in a lot of ways, my daughter, physically and mentally. And it hasn't been as much of a challenge as I anticipated. I mean, obviously becoming a mother for anybody who injury or not is a huge life change, but being able to have somebody that gives you more of a reason to get up and make sure you're doing better every single day is life changing. So I, if you're on the fence, if you're a survivor and you're on the fence about becoming a mom, there are tons of resources out there and you could potentially find something that makes you feel a hundred times better and not exacerbate your symptoms. And it was hard for me to find other moms within my community that had children my age because medicine changes all the time. So which are able to take during pregnancy changes all the time. And again, you have to make sure that you have the best care team obstetrically and neuro like for neurology when you're going through that journey in your life. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for opening up and sharing a lot of that. I think it's so encouraging, yeah. especially for me. Like I've got to be honest, I'm kind of nervous and scared. I do want to have kids eventually. I'm not ready yet, but yeah. someday, like I just got married and, you know, we've been talking like maybe in a couple of years, but I'm so nervous because yeah. I feel like my symptoms are still on fire. Like I had a huge yeah. flare up this summer when I had COVID and it caused my whole like nervous system to just freak out on me. And so I've been like flared up so bad and I'm like, okay, like there's no way I feel like I could even fathom, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, pregnancy and becoming a mother until I feel like I'm a little more stable in my own symptoms. But it's encouraging to hear because, you know, you know, and you mentioned like how God created our bodies, right? We also, there's the aspect of life is always going to kind of be out of control no matter what it is and to trust in the Lord yeah. through it, no matter what um, comes. But uh are there any other things you wanted to mention about finding your place in the new normal? What encouragement do you have um, for those survivors listening that might feel like, wow, like I feel like I am in this crazy chaos of a new brain injury, or maybe they've been living with it a long time. What encouragement do you have for them to find their place in that? First and foremost, find a care team and a support system close to you that you can trust and that is willing to go the extra mile for you. Allow those people to help you. Uh, once you have an injury, it's really hard to relinquish control because you don't have a whole lot of control once you have this injury. There's doctor's appointments being made for you. There's places you need to go that you have to go to. Just trust in your care team, trust in your support system and tell your story. You'd be amazed at how many people are there with you, know somebody with you, or have a resource for you. Just tell your story because 
hearing somebody on the other side of the screen or on the other side of the phone or right in front of you say, I understand and truly mean it can change your life Mm -hmm. 100%. And whatever your faith is, whatever you believe in, lean into that as well, because there's nothing that's going to save you quite like whatever your faith is. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing, Amanda. Yeah. And so this is called Hope Survives Thanks Podcast. So well, the last thing I was asked is what are your final words of hope? Would you kind of maybe just shared, but are there any other yeah. words of hope you would have? You. Oh, that's so good. How much time do I have? <laughs> just <Sure>. trusting, <laughs> trusting your body, trusting that your brain is forever going to be healing and your new normal is exactly where you're supposed to be. And it's not, it's going to be tough, but it's not forever. And there are other people out there, you know, in the comments on Christabel's page, on my page, you can find other survivors and just reach out to us because we are an army and we want to be there for you. And I promise that I promise it's going to get better. I promise you're going to feel better. Things are going to change. Your body is forever healing for the rest of your life. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, yeah, so encouraging. Um, Thanks so much so for having if me. people want to get so in touch fun. with you, um, what's the best way for them to do that? So you can either follow my Instagram page, which my handle is just my name, Amanda Alamang. Um, you can Google me. I've just recently found out that I'm not hidden. You can find me anywhere. So my phone number is on the Brain Injury Association of Pennsylvania page, BIAPA.org under the support group listings. You can call me. You can text me. Uh, my email is also there. I am not hard to find. And I am always there for anybody. Like, I love when people reach out. I love helping you. So I don't want anybody to feel alone because if you found us, you're not alone. Oh, thank you so much. I can put your yeah. email in the show notes description. Yeah. How about that? So, Perfect. all right. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much. It was so good to see you. I'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to Hope Survives Podcast. Make sure to subscribe and stay tuned and would love for you to consider leaving us a rating or a review. Check out hopeafterheadinjury.com for more. I'll see you next time. And remember, there's always hope.